Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I am uh, really scared to death to be here. Uh, actually, not because of you, uh, but because I had cataract surgery three days ago, and this is my solo first virgin flight without glasses for the first time in 50 years. <laughs> so, here's the technology, right? Uh, I am so delighted to be with you. Um, I've heard about you for years. I, uh, my very first parish was Christ Church Ridgewood, New Jersey. So um, uh, we always felt we were like in competition with you sometimes. Uh, and which, by the way, is the better city to commute to into the city from. But, uh, but uh, we figured Ridgewood was it. So, and also, um, I have just had the great pleasure of getting to know uh, Dave and Sarah Rosen uh, in my position in the last four years as uh, uh, Vice President of Religion and Senior Pastor at Chautauqua Institution. So, it's, uh, um, I would do anything they asked me to do. So, they invited me to come here, and it's my great pleasure. Um, I'm not sure I have good news for you, though. Um, I I want to talk to you about the war on Christmas, and not the one you think I'm talking about, not the one that um, there are secularists and atheists and, um, and even evangelicals um, think there is a war on Christmas. The war I'm talking about on Christmas is our effort to pretty it up. We all love Christmas. And it's just so beautiful. I mean, look at the Hallmark cards you're getting. And aren't they beautiful? And today's Magnificat, Mary's response to God, is part of it. That is to say, it gets used to pretty up Christmas. And I think we pay a terrible surprise for that. So let me just be clear. I love Christmas. I get goosebumps at midnight service on Christmas Eve, just like everybody else. I am apt to be weepy, and I just love Christmas. But I want to talk to you about the price we pay if that's all we think about Christmas. It's important to remember that these birth stories weren't all that important. Or the church. In fact, it was the fourth century before Christmas was even celebrated. Easter was the celebration. And, um, and so in the fourth century and, and the century, it didn't reach, uh, the custom didn't reach England until the sixth century uh, to celebrate uh, Christmas. And uh, everything we know uh, about Jesus' birth, we get from only two of the four Gospels. Right? Matthew and Luke. Uh, the earliest gospel, uh, Mark, uh, says absolutely nothing about his birth. And the gospel of John only has sort of a, in fact, it begins with a reflection on what it means. But there are no details about, about Jesus' birth in, in Scripture. Um, and, you know, I think it, it took Hallmark to really make it into what it is. I, God, I hope the CEO of Hallmark is not here. <laughs> uh, because I don't, I don't really need to be mean about it. But it is kind of a symbol, isn't it, for how we pretty up this, uh, this story. You see, we say <clears throat> that Jesus is both human and divine. And I actually don't think we believe, not really, in our hearts, because we talk about Jesus, we think about Jesus as divine, right? And it's really hard for us to picture Jesus as just a human being, going through life the way you and I go through life, which means we don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, never mind a year or ten years or to the end of our lives, right? And I, I actually believe 
that Jesus lived his life as one of us, that God made this remarkable decision to want to learn what it was like to be us from the inside out. Now, that was a scandal, an absolute scandal in the ancient world, because no God in his rightful mind, no God in his rightful mind would want to be human. Humans might want to be gods, but no God would want to be human. Ugh. <laughs> and along comes this religion who maintains and worships a God who loved us enough to want to become one of us, to know us from the inside out. And so uh, we might call this Christmas, we might call it the Feast of the Nativity, but I think the better name for it is the Feast of the Incarnation. Now, you can always remember what that word means because the C-A-R-N in incarnation is the same as the C-A-R-N in chili con carne. <laughs> it's, it's chili with meat. And so God makes this remarkable decision to put flesh around God's self, to actually let us be able to see and interact and know this physical person, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, who we come to believe is the perfect revelation of God. So the Feast of the Incarnation celebrates the enfleshment of, of Jesus. And, and yet we've, we've printed him up. We, we sort of think he knew everything that was going to happen to him, and it was just a matter of going through it. And I mean, it might have been hard, but he knew how it was going to turn out and everything. I think it's worth contemplating what would it have been like if, if this Jesus had just been a human being, living his life as a human being, and not knowing how it was going to turn out. And then everything he did and said was even more remarkable because it showed an even deeper faith if he didn't know how it was going to turn out. I like to think that Jesus was uh, the most surprised person on Easter morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was an, um, a uh, medieval uh, theologian, I can't remember his name, who said, God is the newest thing there is. So let's just think for a moment about the humanity of Jesus but let's do it through looking at the humanity of Mary. Now, Mary gets gobbled up by this beautification of Christmas project, right, that we all have. And, and, and in fact, in the Roman Catholic Church, we even get the, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which has nothing to do with the virgin birth. It has to do with the sinlessness of Mary. I mean, I don't know why they stopped there. Why didn't we go back to Mary's parents and then the parents of them? As if flesh is so bad that to be tainted by human sexuality was a scandal and therefore we had to come up with, with the notion that even Mary was untouched by sin, never mind Jesus. So Mary's actually uh, caught up in all of this. Now, let's just think about the story. Uh, remember in the ancient world, stories could be true without ever having happened the way they're told. Right? We all know stories that are true, whether or not the events themselves actually happen. So let's, let's think of this story from a human perspective. Mary and Joseph are, well, Mary's probably an older teenager and Joseph a little bit older. And they're just a couple of good kids who get in trouble. And Mary is pregnant. And everyone knows she's pregnant. And when she's asked about it, she says, well, it's a little hard to explain. <laughs> and Joseph, her betrothed, seemingly has gotten her pregnant, but he, he keeps saying, it's not my it's not my baby. I'm not the father of this baby. It's it's sort of hard to explain. 
But the guys down at the gym, in the Nazareth gym, you know, still teased him all the time about why he was sticking around <clears throat> with this woman, whether, whether or not the baby was his. He had the right to, to just abandon her, and he makes the decision not to. And neither one of them, neither one of them thought they would wind up in a dirty, smelly manger with a bunch of animals. Mary is terrified because so many women in those times would die of childbirth. She's 16, 17 years old. She's got to be terrified. And she knows she's supposed to give me birth, and there they are, far away from home. And Joseph is just a hot mess. He, he hardly knows what a, a woman's body looks like, never mind how to deliver a baby. Like, we're the midwives when you need one. And oh my God, how am I going to clean her up? How am I going to clean up the baby? How am I going to care for them in, in, in this place? You get my notion here that it's not exactly a Hallmark Christmas card. <laughs> and, and when you see that leather either on the card or in that beautiful little crash that I hope you have at home, like I have at home, I love precious so I collect them, right? I love them. They're beautiful. And all the faces are serene. And it's just so lovely that you forget your humor. This was a traumatic event. And it was the result of Mary and Joseph having said yes to God. So what's really going on in this story is that God makes a proposal to Mary to do this remarkable thing and to collaborate with her. And in doing so, I, I think it's a, a remarkable example of God's showing infinite respect, not just for her, but for humanity. God actually asks her, will you, will you cooperate with me in this? And she says, yes. I, you know, I was talking with the director yesterday. I, I, I think maybe there, were, maybe there were young women who said no to God. Maybe several said no before he found one who thoughtfully and prayerfully said yes. But, you know, she was, uh, she was quite a woman. She went on to become uh, a very powerful leader in the early church. So my guess is this didn't happen like over a matter of 10 minutes. You know, God says, I'm gonna do this thing. She says, sure, go ahead, not a problem. <laughs> my guess is she wrestled with God the way Jacob wrestled with the angel. Like, what does this mean? What will it mean for my life? Uh, how is this going to end? It had to have been a very difficult decision. And, and when, when Mary says, let it be unto me according to thy will, <clears throat> that's at the very end of a very long conversation with God. Because she's saying yes with, without actually knowing where it's going to lead. Not unlike Abram, whom God called out and said, I, I'm going to take you to a place that you've never been, and I can't tell you what's going to happen there. All I can tell you is that I'm going to be very good to you. And Abram said yes, and ultimately <coughs> Abraham. So it, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, example of how much God respects us. I think that's lost on us. That God cares enough about us that he would ask Mary for her collaboration. So there's nothing simple and automatic about her, yes. It was probably a very tortured and difficult decision for her to make. So here's the thing. 
If we pretty this story up too much, and we make Mary divine, then she's robbed of her humanity. And if she's not truly human, and frankly, if Jesus is not truly human, then there's nothing in this story for us, because we're not divine. But if they are truly human, and maybe there's a message for us here and about the way we live our lives. Remember that when it gets to Holy Week. Go through Holy Week, at least entertain the notion that Jesus might not have known how it was going to turn out. And then look at how miraculous his actions and his words are. So here's, here's what you get if you remember that they're human. You get the notion that God is calling all of us to collaborate with God to do God's will in the world. You know, God has no hands but ours. And so it's important to remember that there's a lot in this story for us. Because, because God calls us, sometimes in dramatic ways, sometimes in little ways. When I began to um, feel called to be a bishop, uh, I didn't think that was such a great idea. And I wasn't sure whether that little voice in my head was God's voice or my own ego doing a magnificent impression of God. <laughs> and so when, when you feel yourself called to do something and you think God might be behind it, there, there are some ways you can tell if it's God or not, I think. And at least it's what I've learned. First of all, it's going to be asking you to do something hard and that you probably don't want to do. If, if, if you feel God is calling you to do something that you desperately want to do, be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if that tiny little voice in your head is calling you to do something hard and substantive and good, and you have to wrestle with it before you can ever say yes to it, then there's a pretty good chance it's not speaking to you. The second thing is, you have to choose whether or not to say yes to it without knowing how it's going to end. Almost never do you know how it's going to end. And in fact, the, 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 the yeses that are the most difficult are the ones that seem like they could go terribly wrong or exact a terrible price. And the question is, do you have the courage to say yes to those things? And then thirdly, God never makes the promise for it to be smooth sailing. God only promises to be with us, however it turns out. I will be with you to the end of time. So, so what is God calling you to today, right now? I don't know. Maybe God is calling you to a career change. Maybe God is calling you into a marriage or out of a marriage. Maybe God is calling you to become a parent or to make the decision not to become a parent. Maybe God is calling you to be honest about something in a relationship that's important to you and scares you to death to be that honest with that other person. Maybe God is calling you to admit that you have an addiction. Maybe God wants you to ask for help. And it's about the last thing in the world you want to do. Or maybe it's just simply God calling you to make peace with a reality in your life that you wish were different. God might call you to a very big and dramatic thing. And God might call you to do the next small thing that you need to do to follow God's will. But 
God is calling you. That I'm sure of. The only question is, what is this God calling you to? And remember that God doesn't just call individuals. God calls whole communities. God called the entire Hebrew people. And God could be calling Christ Church. And what would God be calling Christ Church to in its 140th year? I don't know, but I suspect God is, uh, I don't know, nibbling at, at your heels about something. There's something that needs doing that Christ Church could best do in the world. And the question is, will you have the courage to do that? Will you have the courage to do that? The good news is, if you say yes to that thing, or that group of things, you won't be alone. You're never alone when God calls you to something. And this is the season of Emmanuel. Remember, Emmanuel means God with us. So God just promises, not that it'll be easy, but that God will always be with us, no matter what. So I didn't come here to rain on your Christmas parade. I didn't come here to talk you out of enjoying your crash at home, or the Hallmark greeting cards that you get from friends. But I am suggesting to you that reframing it as a human story, which turns out to be a holy and divine story, is a reframing that that just might help you this Christmas. It certainly helps me. I still bask in the beauty of this story, um, and I'm not one bit embarrassed about going to church on Christmas Eve and crossing my fingers that we'll hear the Christmas story from the old King James Bible with all the THs on the ends of words, because that's what I heard growing up, and I love it on that night. <laughs> on that night. But the next day, I want to be thinking about it differently. So after the lights are taken down and the poinsettias are gone, and all the pressures have been put away until next year, after that happens, then ask, so what is God calling me to do? What is God calling us to do right now? And then pray for courage, that you might have the courage to say yes to God and what God is calling you to do, just like Mary did so very many years ago. And two weeks from the day, on Christmas, when you're gathered around your tree and you look over at the little beautiful manger, I want you to remember that today I said to you with all my heart, Merry Christmas. Amen. Amen.